The Venus Project. Team Speak Seminar. August 12, 2012. In presenting the Venus Project, you're taking away a person's identity. They identify with the world they've been brought up in, and you can't turn it around immediately. But you have to know if they have some technical background. Technical background means an associative system that has physical correlation. Whatever field it is, if it's plumbing or drafting, you work in that field and you, you show them the relevance of that system to other systems. Now, in working with a person that gives you a hard time due to ego, it might take you four or five years to get to that person. And you don't want to do that because with children you make an investment. You say, if they get out of high school, you can begin to talk to them. You can't even begin to talk to them. You can only fortify them as youngsters, give them a method of evaluation. But they won't be able to use that method until much later. Actual putting it to use. So you don't want to tackle people that, that are four or five year projects because you can't talk to them for four or five years unless they do some thinking too about it. And most people use the system they have because it's the only one they know of, and they keep using it. Now, the reason you can't talk to K, I don't want to mention names, because you know what I'm referring to, is because they like their system and they use it. it although it gets them into trouble, and they feel it's no use talking to certain people, but they don't alter their behavior. There are people that use the same behavior. They don't know they're making an assumption that by being direct with the other people, they can alter their behavior. They can't. They have to accept these as valid tools until they do. Now, you're always dealing with associative memory. Do you know what that means? That's a track in the brain already there. And you can't undo that track except over years of experience. And they have to think about it and come back to you and say, if that's so, what about this? If they don't question that, they say it's no use questioning because I don't get any answers. They don't get any answers that they identify with. When he came over here and he said, I hate domes and I like it certain types of architecture. It means he wasn't open to anything. He was announcing, and I don't want to tackle that. Not at all. I made no attempt at tackling it, because the person wasn't asking questions. If he was a, a student who said, I don't really know it all, I'd like to know what your views are regarding that, then I'd like to contradict them. I'd like to bring up my own views. Well, his own views are not based upon the wrong track study, so I wouldn't tackle it unless he said, I'm not sure, how does conditioning work? If he posed the right questions, I would give him the right answer. But if he says, I think that people can surpass that background, I didn't want to get into a discussion on that. But that's what he was saying when he said, I hate domes. He didn't come in and say, why a dome? He was giving his personal reactions. And Karen, when she gets disappointed in birth, she gives her reactions to birth. That's not what the cure is. The cure is, why does birth insist on that system? Because it's his identity. And if you take away his identity, he loses his ego. Because my views are just as good as your views. Is that how he approached it before? Did he always No, I didn't approach him. Because he never came at me saying, why do you conclude that? Or how is it that you arrive at that viewpoint? No inquiry. But if he doesn't understand the basics of semantics, you can't begin to talk to him. Unless he says, why semantics? 
what can you tell me that might give me better tools? They really are lost. They don't even know it. And that's a terrible thing not to know when you're lost, when you're not sure. There's a word called doubt and certainty in science. The certainty is that if you pour water at a given rate, fast, it won't go into a narrow tube. You have to pour it in relation to your experience with water. But if you have no experience with water, you can fabricate all kinds of stories and keep nurturing them. They're based on false assumptions. And if you believe that some people have it and some don't, you can't communicate with people. But if your communication alters human behavior, use it. If it doesn't alter the behavior, it means you're not getting to that person. Or that person doesn't want to be gotten to. For whatever reasons, it may destroy their self-sufficiency. You understand that? Why should I surrender to you? My opinion is just as good as yours as an ego trip. I don't never ask a person to surrender. I ask a person, is there anything you don't understand, anything you'd like clarification on? Now, uh, I've never heard anybody who said to me, you know, very few people, that altered my thoughts along a lot of lines. I've been so... The acquisition of better tools is what they're getting. And if they don't get the better tools, if you're involved in an ego trip, you try to get at them with human reason. It doesn't work like my mother, or like your mother. It just doesn't work. Because your mother doesn't say, why are you trying all these different foods? Because I'm not sure. Oh, I, I think you're going off the deep end. Well, your mother doesn't object. She doesn't know how to object. So she says, you're a strange boy. Whatever she says. That means she doesn't understand you. Your mother never tried to understand you. She had a strict instruction she was going to give you. Your mother felt that she knew more about a subject than you did. Well, she felt that way. Otherwise, she'd say, how do you think of things? Why do you go with Jock? He's much older than you. Or whatever it is, she would question those things. And there are people who don't even know there's anything wrong with them, with their viewpoint. Karen may be bright in particular areas, but there's particular areas she can't get out of. And you can't discuss it because she never even thinks about it. She thinks, well, has some ideas, but you can reach him, and she doesn't know how. And so, only when a person inquires into things do they want to know the answer. But like that guy made a lot of statements yesterday. Mm -hmm. The guy, the price system guy, he did not inquire. He just repeated, if you do, if you don't have incentive, what will motivate a person? Mm -hmm. He was they don't already, have money. He was a victim of culture. They don't have money. He was not asking questions. Mm -hmm. He doesn't even know what to ask a question means. But I was, what surprised me is that he was with this woman who was very different than he was. All I'm saying is you have to look at a person and say, do I want to take it on or do I want to, do I want to live with those limitations? You don't want those limitations because they're painful. So you get off. And whenever you get off, just make sure you've tried to give them information. But you haven't succeeded. Because taking information to you means surrendering their value system. Not just listening to you, you know what I mean? They're losing the argument. They want to win. That's their motive. They want to maintain one upmanship. And if they listen to you and take your advice, they've given up their own ego. And that's very hard for people to do. 
Is that true all the time with interaction with people? Almost all the time. Very few people who say, without those tools, I couldn't have made it. They have to have tools. You know what that means, instruments. A surgeon without his instruments can't do anything. He can't perform surgery without the instruments and knowing how to use them. Uh, I would say that most people don't give people sufficient information to make the change. A lot of doctors try to pass the examination and that's rote learning. And rote learning does not make a person creative at your point of view. And if you know how you arrive at it, because your father was always dominant, you want to be dominant. And if you pick that value system, that's just because you're against your old man. But you don't want to be against your old man, you're looking for a better value system. One that's more closely related to the real world. So you don't you don't consider scientific science applied to the social system necessarily to be a value system or at least an adequate value system. No, it may be a person that picked it up that uses it but doesn't understand it. There are people that use tools in a limited way but they really don't understand it. Understanding comes with tossing ideas around in your own head saying if that's so then this may not be so. Like you can take the things I talk about and reduce them to semantic disturbances if you want to. Or you can say that really people don't understand anything because they wouldn't be part of the system if they did. They couldn't participate in it. I don't know what you mean by reduce them to semantic disturbances. Take what you say and reduce uh, them to the person semantic disturbances. says the price system is awful but I'm in the real estate business and I got to sell buildings. Mm -hmm. They still participate in the game because they want the advantages of the system but they don't want to give up participation because they can't. They really can't. Now Karen has a certain point of view which she can't give up. She would fear loss of identity if she did. Nor can she step out of that She has difficulty. Unless she came here and said, what do you think of my relationship with Beryl? I said, what is your relationship? Does she see Beryl as a gigantic intellect? How does she, I don't know that. And what does she understand of what she's been exposed to? I don't know. And he does win approval from certain people because he's wiser than they are. Do you know what I mean? In some areas of the social complex, he doesn't understand the system as a system. First of all, you can tell you're up against an ego problem. You can tell that at the beginning. But you go on for the benefit of the other people. You don't cater to one person too much. Okay? Because you lose the others. I just want to remind you, so you don't spend too much time. There's a normal tendency to try to get to people. The word I use a lot called identification. I used to think as you did, exactly, you know. But it was hard for me to give up my ego. But the person says they're ready for change. They have to listen to records, read books. A book doesn't embarrass a person when he reads a book. He reads it and he says, yeah, that was a stupid thing I did, but he's not embarrassed in the presence of other people. But if he surrenders to you or you, he loses his ego. It's better to give a person a book because they're not surrendering in front of you. They feel when they're giving up their thoughts, they're surrendering to you and losing their one-upmanship. But if you have a need to learn, You just say, my tools obviously are inadequate in some areas. And if you don't get the right tools, you don't accept them. If I say something that doesn't make sense to you, you contradict it. That's all right. 
nothing the matter with that. Not as an ego trip, not to maintain one-upmanship. I would say that it's surrendering of the ego that enables one to grow. That seems to be the only thing. Where you give up the ego trip in exchange for growth. Like uh, sometimes when a person says, yes, Fresco, but you forgot the main thing, human emotions. That's an investment into some area. Or a psychologist. A psychologist will argue with me a lot, you know. But they don't, it's an ego trip being a psychologist. And most psychologists that I knew in the past had a very low self-sufficiency. They became a psychologist because it gave them the illusion of a higher self-sufficiency. Hmm. But they didn't. I used to speak at the Los Angeles Psychological Association where many psychologists came to a place and we talked about different things. They wanted to share ideas. But they couldn't make the fact that a uh, man was a machine. I could not present it in an acceptable way. A definition of a machine is what prevented them from learning. Was that what your talk was about to them? Yes. What's the definition of a machine that you'd use? No. That everything in the machine is moved by something else. Yeah. And there's no part of the machine that does all the moving of its own. Yeah, and that's why a mechanic is easier to talk to. If you start out with the transmission is turned by the engine, he will understand that. Now, if you get back to human behavior, he may not see that connection. It's hard for a mechanic to look at the human brain as being shoved. Or well, doesn't know what's doing the shoving. And the proof of that, if you want to prove it to him, you say, when did you learn to talk? Mm -hmm. He cannot say, February the 2nd, Saturday morning. Because it's such a long, drawn-out process, he doesn't even know where it began. Don't you respect your mother? Well, a person that uses that language is a victim of culture. Don't you respect your mother? Just being your mother. She deserves the respect. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a real product of the culture. The person that uses those examples is very difficult to deal with. After all, he is your dad. You should listen to him. No, a person cannot command control because of age or because he's a professor of physics. Now, I would say an aeronautical engineer can apply the right amount of dihedral to wings if you're carrying a four-ton bomb load. He knows how to do that. But he doesn't think in terms of, what am I working on? This isn't social. And if I worked on social stuff, would it do more good for society? He doesn't question those things. I think that the more people that study engineering principles, the better off society is. The more people that study business management, society cannot grow. I don't see how it can grow, that's what I mean by that. And unless a businessman comes up to me and says, uh, let me show you where it grows. I haven't had that experience yet. Okay? That's the one thing I wanted to get across to you, that you try not to waste too much time. But don't give up on a person. If you identify with them, they're, they're willing to surrender their ego. If you made the same mistakes they made, they can surrender their ego. But if you come up as a superior being, you got it all wrong. I'll tell you how it works. That's not good. That's the main thing I want to try to get across to you guys. Your, your hopes that you have with people. First question is, how are the 70s unreleased lectures coming along? We have four more edited. You know, we're talking about putting them out as an MP3. So we're working on that, maybe in about a week, 
you think, John? Yeah. Okay, hopefully in about a week. Jacques, what would you say has contributed significantly to your good health and long life? I don't pay any attention to that. I just go on doing what I do. I don't do anything special. I don't do anything special to promote my health. Well, you watch what you eat now. Only to a limited extent. Are there still plans to release new lectures on different topics on TVP media? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Joel is taking care of TVP media. What significant information did Jack get out of the book Looking Backward by Bellamy? The simplification of explaining complex social systems with simplistic examples. I love the examples he used. The parable of the water tank, for example. You want to describe that or briefly or? No, you read the book. Yeah, that's good. Also, I remember you talking about, and you can tell me if I'm not correct here, was that during the time when Looking Backward came out, Bellamy got a lot of letters. And for those who don't know, this is kind of, when was it, in the 1800s or late? I imagine. 18 something, I don't know. And he was talking about a better world. Conditions were really bad back then, a lot of slave labor and poor health and everything else. And Bellamy was a wealthier person, wasn't he, from a wealthy I background? Don't, I don't know. Yes. Okay, I thought so. Maybe I'm wrong. But anyway, he wrote of a better world and what it would look like, even technically to some degree. And a lot of people back then got in touch with him and wrote letters and said, let's do this, you know, let's build this. And he said, I can't, I'm not a technician. And as I remember, that helped initiate your direction somewhat when yes. you read it when you were young? You're right there. Okay. So Jack set out to further the aims of building a better world, but technically as well, which a lot of futurists don't do today. Would you agree that corporatocracy is the end game of capitalism? Yes, I would. It's kind of the evolution of capitalism. Yes. Would you agree that throughout history, groups that opposed a new vision ended up getting killed? Not always, but sometimes they were. They were tortured to death or burned alive, and sometimes they weren't. They were just thought to be deviant or screwballs. Jacques, what did you think of Bertrand Russell's work? Have you read any of his books? It appears he has some respect for behaviorism and the scientific method, Bertrand Russell? Yes, I would agree that it was a necessary ingredient to help people learn how to think about different things with less bias. If you woke up tomorrow as a 20-year-old, Jacques, and still had the intelligence and associations as you have as a 96-year-old today, what would you do differently to achieve the Venus Project? Oh, I would not be in control, so therefore I would not be able to do very much. If I don't control the situation, if I don't have access to NBC, CBS, and publications, there's nothing I can do. Are there any updates on the motion picture? And is Future by Design embracing multi-platform storytelling, the technique of storytelling. I don't know what you mean by this future by design embracing multi-platform storytelling. The technique of telling a single story, a story experience across multi-platforms, okay, and formats to supplement their motion picture. The motion picture we commissioned kind of a down payment with a scriptwriter who we had met, and it really was not to our liking. It was similar to other scripts that we had submitted. So Jacques and I are taking it and doing it ourselves more so. We're going to try and lay out the entire thing. We don't see, uh, we don't have too much respect for what we've seen in scriptwriters, although we'll still be looking for some. 
but we are going to try and lay out the entire thing ourselves. The good thing about that is that we won't be paying ourselves, so we'll have a lot of funds left over to further this once we do get it finished, and we can perhaps show it to other script writers, or we'll have funding to get a budget and whatever else we can do in regards to maybe a trailer and other things, or have funds to work with traveling to try and pitch it to people or whatever we have to do. So in that way, it'll be good. Has anyone ever been at the tour of the Venus Project been very argumentative with the information, Jacques lectures? How do you deal with situations like that? Has anybody been at the tour who had been argumentative? No, not really. There are people that were naive that didn't understand it, that needed more elaboration. But I've never had any conflicts like that. Yeah, there are some people that come to the tour and still uphold the monetary system, but... Well, very few people. Yeah, and it's interesting to watch... I don't bother with that. No, sometimes it's interesting to watch how you kind of cater to them in certain ways and how they become more sympathetic. Yeah, we modify them very little. The last person that came, actually, like last week, who was like that, the rest of the crowd was really working on him as well yes. to try and modify how he thinks about it. So that was interesting. He was put down by the, most of the guests. Is there any concrete plans to get an autobiography completed of Jacques before he's gone? No, we haven't been working on an autobiography, no. really. If there are any writers out there that would be interested, we would be interested as well experienced writers in the field. Have you tried to do a survey of all the Venus Project supporters around the world? No, <laughs> we don't, we yet. don't know, yeah. Having studied the Venus Project, it is harder to see people suffer because of money, knowing there's a better way. Perhaps educating people about the Venus Project is the best way to cope with deficiencies created by money. Do you have other suggestions? No, just read the books, view our tapes, and become familiar as you can with the Venus Project. Yes, I would say talking to as many people as you can is, if that's the only thing you're able to do with your skills, it's extremely important and a tremendous contribution. And you get better at it as you practice. That's true. Would it be wise to create a Venus Project only operating system for all computers? This would protect our systems from virus or hacker attacks. Do you have experience to do this? We don't have experience to do this. There may be some in the group who have, but right now the people who are working with computers in this way or programming, they're helping us do a new website. We're working on that. It might be a project we can get into later. Are you open to prearranged meetings in London when you're coming? Yeah, if there are several people, perhaps, a group yeah. of people that want to get together, yes. You can write me about it at meadows at thevenusproject.com or Andrew. Have you ever thought any time in your life, Jacques, to just try and fit in? No, never have. <laughs> no, I've never seen him do that either. <laughs> it's like trying to fit into the clan, something like that. You couldn't just fit in. What would be the role of psychiatry in the future, if any? Are things like schizophrenia caused by environment too? Or are they physically caused? I really don't always know the answer to that. There's a lot of work that has to be done in order to decipher exactly what the conditions are that produce that, whether it's a form of a disease that affects the brain, or whether it's due to habits that are not valid, or whether it's due to individual projection. There's a lot to be studied in that area to be certain as to what produces it. Do you think that a value system can look like schizophrenic? Yes, I think it can. 
What would the role of psychiatry be? Would There's there be no role of psychiatry. Children are brought up to be able to handle situations, not need psychiatric advice or psychological advice. They would be brought up to understand the factors that shape their values and learn how to ask questions about their own insecurities. That would help them to overcome most of the stresses produced by invalid information. What frequency, this is about eating, what frequency and portion size does Jacques and yourself eat? I watched a Horizon Science program the other day about portion size and eating frequently, which has a direct link to age. I don't... I can't deal with that. I don't quite fully understand how you mean that. Well, how big of portions do you eat? I don't know if you're talking about this, but I've seen that studies with rats that they've done where if you eat a little bit more continuously during the day, if they feed rats more often, but a smaller portions that they live longer. I don't know if you're talking about that type of study. But, yes, that's true. But we don't adhere to anything like that. As long as you don't stuff yourself at each meal, <laughs> always leave room. What, for apple pie? Okay, Jack Reed's book, The Next Evolution, says we need to change from an everyone for themselves attitude to a highest good for all attitude. Do you think this shift in attitude needs to occur before the Venus Project can come into existence? Yes, I do think so. What would happen to the current zoos, animal zoos, in the resource-based economy society? And animals would be put back in natural surroundings and people would walk through caged areas. The people would be caged. They'd walk in caged areas observing animals in their natural condition. Putting them in a zoo is like putting them in prison. And that is not a natural condition for the animal. I have a question. Um, hopefully everyone's okay with it. I just, it wasn't read in the announcement, but it's uh, basically I'm trying to offer some people some practical things that the everyday person could do to help advocate for the Venus Project. And other than a short list on my website, I haven't been able to come up with any. So I was hoping someone could give me something practical. First, become familiar with introduction to science. How scientists arrive at decisions. And once you learn how they arrive at decisions, you'll be better skilled at presenting the Venus Project. So try to become familiar with various aspects of scientific disciplines, from chemistry, physics, engineering, mathematics, whatever you feel competent in handling, then try using it to alter people's values and behavior. I would like to ask the past one, if I may. If a person would like to write the book, what kind of information uh, you would like to be in the book about the Venus Project and how the person can present their future vision from this point of view so people will engage in understanding of the Venus Project and be yeah, basically like that? I would present ideas that would show people what altered my behavior and values. And also, when you look into the works of a lot of creative people, you can ask them what their major influences were, or what made them deviate from conventional thinking. And uh, you'll find that either reading other books or associating with people with a different value system, and learning that there are other ways of thinking about things and that we cannot observe anything absolutely. We can only observe it in relation to our background. If we don't have the proper background, we can't understand the submitted ideas that are radical or different. How would you describe the process which person can use to envision the future? I mean, uh, not imagine it, but extrapolate in the future. You use your knowledge of present day systems. For example, you know that motion pictures will eventually become 
3D on tier television. Then there'll be full size imaging. The next thing is teletactile, meaning touch. So you can touch and smell apple pie and anything else cooking. You'll be able to generate the same frequencies that affect the olfactory nerve. So you can smell the forest, the green, the fresh air. You can feel the fresh air breeze on your face watching TV in 3D that's teletactile, meaning not just 3D, but the images in front of you. When a person cuts a beefsteak, you'll be able to smell it, almost taste it. I think the question too was, what processes do you use to be able to extrapolate for the future? You ask, what is reality? What's the difference between reality and a generated image? A generated image of a person in 3D, you're not able to shake hands with that person. Although the person may have died some years ago and do a lecture on TV that has been pre-recorded. But what you have to do in the future to generate that image full size so you can even shake hands and question the speaker and provide other changes that have occurred and inform that I person but you have to know their value system in order to do that to make a recording of a value system you'd have to know how that person thinks and the major influences in their own thinking if you don't know that, you cannot get to people. Okay, I think I understood the, I understood the answer. But can you please um, give the same example, how you can socially extrapolate that, how you can extrapolate with values, because it's a little bit easier when you are thinking about current technology, but it's very hard to do it with values. Well, the values have no no description, you can't deal with them. If they have a description, you can begin to deal with them. If you can't describe where your values come from, if you can't describe what your values are, or why you pick certain segments of different values that you hear, if you don't know that, you don't understand the psychology that affects selection and choice. How do you extrapolate what the values might be in the future? I guess in the future within a resource-based economy. In a resource-based economy and the new schools, a set of values that have no relationship will never emerge. You do that in the schools. In the very beginning of education, you show children that which is relevant to their lives. You don't teach them things that have never been verified or checked out. I learned about the Venus Project through the Zeitgeist uh, series by Peter Joseph, and uh, I spoke to Roxanne on the phone a few months ago, um, but I was curious as to, it seems like the, the Zeitgeist movement and the Venus Project have a similar goal uh, or outcome, and I'm just curious as to why the relationship uh, hasn't kind of been working together on this goal. Well, when the Zeitgeist movement first came about, Peter approached us and said he was going to do a movement and he wanted, based on Zeitgeist's addendum, and he wanted it to be the activist arm of the Venus Project. But as time went on, we really had really no, very little association with the movement other than they did, people did help when we went on the world lecture tour and also Jacques met a lot with the members to try and bring them up to date as to what the Venus Project was. But we weren't involved that much. We didn't have much to say in terms of the direction of the movement. It was Peter's movement and it was going off in different directions than what the Venus Project wanted to do. And we had, you know, the people who worked toward this direction were with the Zeitgeist movement. And when we, when we separated, or we said we weren't advocating the, the Zeitgeist movement anymore, we had and for the first time, people helping us doing what we thought was important to help this direction, to help the Venus Project. Jack also felt that... It was going off in another direction, not in the direction of the Venus Project. And it wasn't and it cooperative. it can't go off in any direction. It has to be specific. 
if you hope to attain a world without war, poverty, hunger, unemployment, you have to redesign the social system. And it wasn't a cooperative venture between the Venus Project and the Zeitgeist Movement, really. So we felt it might get run into the ground and using our materials, and we wanted to pull out and promote what we thought was necessary for this direction. Yes. And the things that we wanted to do, they were bucked a lot with Peter, and so it wasn't a comfortable situation at all. You know, and it was supposed to be the activist arm of the Venus Project, but it ended up very often near the end saying that there's another group working toward the same thing we're working toward and when they were describing the Zeitgeist Movement. And so it became something very different. I do have to say, too, that everything that the Zeitgeist Movement advocates in regards to the future was taken from Jacques' work. So for Jacques to turn over the whole direction and the activism and everything else is somebody else's organization that didn't know as much about this direction. Jacques made a comment about how I think the Zeitgeist movement knew nothing. And if you watch the rest of it, you would understand what he was talking about, that the Zeitgeist movement really contributed nothing to the pool of knowledge of the Venus Project. They did help tremendously advocate things that they learned from the Venus Project, but they didn't arrive at these directions. Since then, I've heard Peter say a lot of nasty things about how Jacques did not arrive at anything, but is totally a ridiculous statement. So, you know, Jacques arrived at the resource-based economy and the values that helped promote this and did a lot of experimentation in all sorts of erroneous notions that this system promotes that he showed does not work, you know, ideas like purpose and instinct, well, and not instinct, but other things. He, he really lays out a value system for a resource-based economy, and none of that was done through the Zeitgeist movement. So it's a more appropriate for us to call it the Venus Project and work under the guidance of the person who arrived at this direction. Just mind, I guess, real quick, um, do you explain um, how you view protesting? Because uh, I'm kind of feeling personally that uh, in order to get this message out, more attention needs to be given in a, in a certain way. But uh, I, I think you mentioned before that protesting is kind of a waste of time. So, uh, you know, the Occupy movement was really successful in a lot of ways, but in my view, it was also very uh, unsuccessful. So what, what is your view and Jacques' view on uh, protesting? or some kind of uh, awareness bringing? If you protest the present economy, if you point out the shortcomings of the present day world, it's useful only if you offer a possible alternative. But if you just criticize the stock market or market. investors or bankers, if you criticize bankers and their corrupt behavior, it's not enough. You have to also point out what will work. You have to work on a transportation system that doesn't have the amount of oscillations or accidents that the present day transportation has. You have to show new ways of doing things. If you don't do that, you just leave people in midair and confused. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I meant it more, I'm sorry, maybe I misspoke. I meant it more like a like MLK did the March on Washington, something that's just like a, an awareness bringing, not more of a protesting and critiquing the system, but something that's just more like, hey, we're here and we have a lot of people who want this. Yeah, well, we have to know what they want and whether it's attainable. And if so, what you have to do to attain it. You have to also show what the schools of the future would be like, what they would teach children, so you'll know that they don't grow up with aberrant viewpoints or unrelated viewpoints. But I think any type of presentation or demonstration or anything like that, if you're trying to present some of these ideas in a very definite direction, is useful. But like you said, Jack, just protesting is not helpful. Only if it offers solutions or possible answers, it's useful. 
So if it just criticizes, it's useless. Okay, thank you. I have a question here from the audience. It says, how much time does Jacques think that our behaviors as a human being would be changed when we'll be in the RBE system? Because what I'm seeing in the monetary system, the major problem isn't outwardly, it's in us. So that is why I am wondering how long it would take for the whole human population to be in this changing process. Depends on what the members do to inform other people. If they do nothing, nothing will occur. It doesn't depend on Jock and Roxanne. It depends on what the members do. And also it depends on whether we get on the media. If we can't get on NBC, CBS, or news media, we can't change people. We have to have access to those things. So when you say that, you don't say from the day Fresco has access how long would it take? That'd be different. It takes about just a few months to alter the behavior of most people, if you control the media. If you have no access or control of the media, it may not occur. Say for an example, within a city, if we had the city built, how long do you see changes? Just a how few would months. it happen? Just a few months. It doesn't take very long. How would you instigate that within the city itself? Oh, within the city, you'd have free classes to train people or teach them how to approach the great majority of people with obsolete values. You'd have to show them the way to do it. There are many different ways, depending on the background of the people you're trying to reach. They would learn the different ways in the first experimental city. There'd be classes on behavioral, modification. Also, all of the media and the materials that would be put out from the first city, whether it be books or videos or movies or TV shows or gaming would all be used to help change people's values in that way. That's well, what would be done. Update their values. Mm -hmm. I have another question here in the chat. Do you think that people in power are well aware about environment shaping behavior and about semantics and they apply it with the purpose of keeping things as they are? I don't think they're aware of it, but I think they believe that that's up to each individual. They believe it's intuitive within a person's behavior. Some people are creative, some are lazy, some are hardworking. I don't believe that. I believe that their values are shaped by the culture they live in. And people who don't question those values are victims of that culture. But things like, I think they're quite aware of it in segmented ways in terms of they understand the role that advertising does in oh, terms of use, selling a product or they to use modify the systems. behavior. They yeah. use the systems, but they don't understand them really. You can actually watch the guy who, who set up Khan Academy. I forgot his last name, how he described why he did that, because he, work, he was working with their uh, hedge fund managers or people who are uh, uh, huge investors who um, try to get, who, who making lots of money and he find out that some of them don't know the basic math. So he set up educational course for them. It's grow to uh, Khan Academy. So they hiring people who know how to work with the system, or at least partially understand how to tweak some responses in the human brain, but they all are limited to their specific field. Yeah, yes, that's, that's, pretty, pretty that's true. Yeah. If they really did understand the notion of how environment changes behavior and creates values, then they would be advocating a change of the environment. You know, there are some psychologists and psychiatrists that hit on it to some degree, talking about people are drug addicts because they come from a dysfunctional background, or, you know, most of the people in prisons are poor and things like that because they're deprived of goods or services or different love and attention when they're younger. 
but they don't really put it together. They don't take it any farther than that, because as I mentioned, if they did, they would be advocating something very different and they would be saying, okay, well, what kind of environment do we need to create a different type of behavior to eliminate war and poverty and hunger and selfish behavior? They don't take it much farther than that. I agree with that. So it's really not a philosophy that helps advocate this direction. To help, when I mean this direction, I mean the free enterprise system. It doesn't perpetuate the free enterprise system. They don't want people to think in those terms because then they would start to question all of their surroundings and that would not be a good idea. You can control people if you give them freedom. So they try to make people alike and that way you can control people. You can get them to change their clothing by fashion. You can get people to change their views by showing a movie actor smoking and driving a certain kind of car. And if you do that, you can alter their behavior. But if their behavior becomes based upon scientific scales of performance, it's very hard to use propaganda. Propaganda doesn't work on well-informed people. So you misinform them, give them misinformation, make all generals appear like they're making good decisions, make war seem like we are right, they are wrong. They are always wrong. We are always right and God's on our side. That's propaganda. And I think it is deliberately used to perpetuate the system for those who have advantage in the system. Yes, I think I they agree know with that, that much. The people elected to political office are not put there to change things. They're put there to keep things as they are, as near as possible. The political party has no aim at improving the lives of the majority of people. Their aim is to keep the profit system working. I've got another question here from the audience. As TVP students, we are reading, writing about, and discussing the materials with an in-house study group. Is there more we can engage in to speed up the learning process? Yes, if you belong to a church group or a political organization, or if you belong to any club, get up and present the Venus Project. That's a, you have to make people aware of it and what it hopes to accomplish. That is a good education when you try and present it to others. I would say also, if you're studying the book with a group of people, which is a great idea, also listen to some of the old classic lectures from the 70s and 80s. They have some really interesting ideas as well to discuss and kick around when you're listening together. The fastest way to do it is to read the book, The Best That Money Can Buy. If but, you read that book a couple of times, you'll get the general idea. Uh, so but, I would say that one book will help you a great deal. That's why we wrote it. Yes, I would also agree, but I think the classic lectures are also very informative in different ways. A lot of the same people used to come to Jacques' lectures about three times a week. And so he'd get into more detailed conversation on specific topics, which were very interesting. So if you haven't heard those, it's a good thing to listen to. Okay, I guess we'll wrap it up for the day. Thank you everyone and, so and very much. Yeah. And keep the questions coming. Yeah, thanks Thank a lot you. for your help and thanks for looking into the information. Thanks to you guys as always. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks.